years ago, and it was in the 70s, uh, probably around 74, 75, there was a fella uh, going around teaching transcendental meditation. And I worked with a, a man who had, uh, had started doing this transcendental meditation. And it was, a, it was a pretty hot item in America at the time. And uh, Zen was there, you know, practiced by college students and the intelligentsia, but it was not, it was not practiced by everybody. So uh, we got to talking one day and uh, people at that period, at that period I was already a monk, but nobody knew I was a monk which uh, throughout life when I'd work places, uh, I never announced it and rarely did they know it because for those watching this video on YouTube, um, in Buddhism we do not proselytize, uh, really in any way, shape or form. We don't go out looking for converts and we don't ask people to convert. And we have a new person here this morning and he will be surprised to find out that he could come here for the next 20 years and nobody would ever ask him to become a Buddhist or a Zen Buddhist, whatever. So, but I remember the conversation because they had done some scientific studies. Now, if you don't know, if you're so young that you don't remember the era of transcendental meditation, it costs money because you had to go hook up with a teacher who would teach you the transcendental meditation and you would get a, a secret mantra that you would recite in your head while you were doing meditation. And this would cause all sorts of wonderful things to happen in your life. But it costs money. So because it costs money, there was a certain amount of marketing that went along with it. Now this was, they weren't selling religion. They were selling the practice of transcendental meditation. And so this guy said to me, he found out, uh, that I was a Zen Buddhist and this is because two or three times a year I would have to leave work early and, uh, and change in the nice clothes. I worked in a garage, change in the nice clothes and go to either Long Beach City College or the Catholic High School St. Anthony's and give a talk because they would request, they'd call the temple and request somebody to come and talk about Buddhism. And so as the years passed, I came up with a very standard talk that could be given in about 30 or 35 minutes about Buddhism. And uh, so one day I was leaving to go and he said, well, where are you going? And I said, well, I've got to go over to the high school and give a talk. What are you going to give a talk about? I said, I'm going to give a talk about Buddhism and the practice of Zen. Oh. So as soon as he could, whenever another day came, he started telling me about transcendental meditation, how I should be doing that. And I said, well, that's nice. And he says, well, you know, they've done studies and they've found all of these wonderful things that happen when you do transcendental meditation. And I never can remember anymore because I was never into selling uh, the practice of Zen. It, it seems... Uh, kind of ridiculous to me to go out and try to talk somebody into doing Zen. Zen's hard work, right, Bud High? Very hard. Yeah, it's hard work. And so how am I going to go tell somebody, here, come and do this hard stuff? It's kind of like the gyms, you know, gymnasiums where they sell 1,200% uh, uh, membership because people come three or four times and they go, dang, this is hard work. They expect me to get in here and, you know, walk a mile or two on the treadmill and I got to lift weights and I got, this is hard work. So then they stop going. They say, well, I'll just go uh, twice a week and then I'll go once a week. And maybe I'll go twice a month. And these gymnasiums, they sell, they sell way oversell their membership. Everybody showed up, they couldn't get in. Well, that's, that's like Zen. Zen's not easy. And, and uh, it's hard work. And uh, it doesn't all of a sudden get easy because you build up some muscles. Uh, you're going through layers and layers of stuff. 
So he said to me, he said, well, you know, uh, these are the things we can achieve. One of the things was, and I never can remember what it was, but psychologists were really fascinated by meditation at the time. This is before, if you go to a psychologist now and you have an anxiety disorder uh, of any kind, they will uh, encourage you to do meditation. And uh, this, and it's doctors. You go to your GP and, and you say, I gotta have some of those pills because I'm having panic attacks. And he'll say, well, okay, I'll write you a prescription, but I think you ought to look into meditation. And so meditation keeps popping up. But back in those days, nobody ever, meditation was superstition. When I moved up here in 82, I had to go to a doctor and uh, he asked me what I was doing here and I said, well, I'm, I'm in the process of building a meditation retreat. Oh yeah, I know all about that. And the nurse said, uh, well, what is that? He says, it's self-hypnosis. I have to be honest with you, I'm not sure that I know what self-hypnosis is. I think I have an idea of what it is. I, I read a book one time just to find out what it was because he said, I said, no, I don't think that's what it is. Oh yeah, that's all it is. It's just self-hypnosis. Oh, okay. And why is it such hard work if it's self-hypnosis? You know, because self-hypnosis is not hard work. You know, self-hypnosis is kind of like, I think, you could correct me if I'm wrong. It's kind of telling yourself that everything's okay. Or telling yourself that you're you're okay. Or you're good. Something like that. If you repeat it enough, you start to believe it. If you start to believe it, maybe you act like that. So that's good stuff, you know. Uh, but we know the other side works if you tell yourself that you're bad because people tell you bad like your parents, they tell you you're bad. Eventually you start acting the way they tell you to. If they tell you that you're stupid, at some point you believe it. Maybe that's what self-hypnosis is. I don't know, does that sound like I'm somewhere in the box? Nobody's responding, so I don't know. But uh, he's, and one of the things was brain waves. They'd hook people up in uh, Thich Tianan, who was my master, in his book, Zen Practice and Philosophy, there's a picture of him hooked up to all these electrodes. And uh, the good brain waves, which means that you're peaceful and calm, whatever, I never can remember, are those alphas or betas or whatever they are? Uh, if you have a practice that uh, causes you to go into those brain waves, then that's good. Well, that's what they did with TM, Transcendental Meditation. And they hooked them up and then they found that after a while these guys got very calm, very peaceful. <coughs> and so a lot of people would tell you, well, the purpose, and that's what doctors are doing now. If you have an anxiety disorder, they say, well, you need to practice meditation. Here's some suggestions of what you could do. And they want you to calm down and be quiet and be peaceful. And there's not a thing wrong with that. That's not what Zen is, but there's not a thing wrong with it. Okay, Zen is looking at yourself. And to look at yourself, to truly look at yourself can sometimes be a difficult practice because you might not like what you see. And uh, Zen also implies that you do something about what you don't like. And that's difficult. I mean, that calls for change. And remember, you signed up to go to the gym, but you only went for a week, and then you go, oh, it was too, it was too hard to go. So I, we had a, a couple here yesterday, and they called up and they wanted to come out. And he called up in the morning, and he wanted to come out, and he was interested, kind of like this gentleman here. Same sort of thing. He's interested in Buddhism, particularly in Zen, the practice of meditation. He didn't say practice of meditation, but he said Zen. So they came out, nice couple. They were here actually a pretty long time. And I said, well, let me give you the nickel tour, which I do to everyone. You'll get the nickel tour when I'm done here. And I said, we, we're going to start over here. This is the meditation hall. And we went in the meditation hall, of course. They came early. Uh, no, that wasn't yesterday. That was the day before. 
but uh, I had I had coolers on. I had a cooler on in here, but you know this is Florida weather, so it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. And uh, I said, this is where we practice meditation. That's what this little building is for. And he said, so what have you gotten? What has meditation done for you? That was his question to me, and I said, absolutely nothing. So. You know, he didn't know what to do with that because I'm back years ago with this gentleman that informs me that he does transcendental meditation and it does all these wonderful things for him. And I, I had my Zen master hat on. All of a sudden I reached in my sleeve and pulled it out and said, it's done nothing for me. Which it hasn't. Meditation has done nothing for me. You know, it's not going to a mental gymnasium. So as we went along, you know, he had lots and lots of questions, and I answered them the best I could. And uh, the two of them met at church, and and uh, they were real interested. Him in particular, he had he he had some ideas about Buddhism were kind of, eh, you know, they were sort of somewhere in the ballpark, maybe over way over there by the back fence, and. Uh, and then he, taught, he started talking about Tai Chi. And see, I found out I knew this guy. I haven't done Tai Chi uh, in quite a while because as we all know that I did my yearly visit to the hospital and, and I, then it takes me a while to recover and, and then everything, nothing gets done around here while I'm recovering so then it takes me a while to get caught up on the chores. You know, it's a vicious circle. And just, and then so, you know, next month, hopefully, I'll sign up for Tai Chi. Well, he started doing Tai Chi two or three months before. Um, I never do it in December because the temple's so busy. So I just gave up because I go pay my money to the park and rec department, and I never get there, and it's a waste of money. So then we realized, and he, he told me about all the things Tai Chi did for him. Well, tai Chi's good stuff. He said he, you know, he had his shoulder was really bothering him for the longest time. He, really couldn't lift his arm how much higher than this and he did Tai Chi and now he could lift his arm and I said yeah it's good stuff and then yoga was mentioned I said yeah it's good stuff and he came back to Zen and I said oh it's hard stuff yeah because you're in a fight it starts off you're in a fight with yourself you're constantly encountering the self and learning to deal with the self so he made me think about that, that, that whole thing of, well, what is the point and purpose of Zen then? If it's not to be so you can lift your arm up like this. You know, Tai Chi is wonderful. I'll do a little commercial for it here. It is, it's really wonderful because it helps older people. And I, all of you, you're going to get older. Chuck's not old. He thinks he's old. But Chuck, Chuck does Tai Chi sometimes. And it helps with balance, doesn't it, Chuck? And I need it because I, I find myself wobbling around all the time now. You know, I reach out for things constantly to make sure I don't fall down. But it's, it's, it's really good stuff. It's slow, it's low impact, or as our teacher says, it's no impact. I've tried to get my older friends to go do it because they're doing nothing physical. So it's good, but yoga's good. Not the yoga that they do in America now. It doesn't look anything like the yoga of India. The yoga they do in America Day is, is just a, this aerobic exercise they do. But if you do the traditional yoga where everything is slow and you move into the asanas and out of the asanas, it's very good for balance. It's good for balance too and for uh, developing uh, body healthy strength, healthy strength. So what's Zen good for? Well, Zen's good for dying. You find, as our head monk remarked this morning, if you truly practice Zen, then you could walk into the forest and lay down and die, and it wouldn't be any big deal. So it is good for dying, yeah. I want to talk about the Eightfold Path. And I probably won't, I won't go into any detail in it, but one of the things I have is just the, the most fantastic memory in the whole world. Yesterday, last night, about uh, 
10 o'clock, I, I had to come down here and go shut the water off. To, you know, there are little tree that's dying over there. I've been watering it like crazy and I had to turn the water off. And then I got ready for bed and I was going to go to bed and I remember that I left the garden on because the timer is no good in the garden. So I had to come down and turn that off. So my memory is just stellar. The good news is I remember both of those things. I've been known to leave water running for two or three days and then wonder who turned that water on. So the Buddha, you know, uh, this gentleman has come and uh, he wants to know about Buddhism. So I'll tell and I'm, I'm trying to, it's Anderson's your last name, right? Yes. I'm remembering that because I like split pea soup. That's the only reason I can remember your last name. Um, Buddhism is very, very simple. The Buddha became awakened after a seven year search for why the world was as it is, or the world is as it is. And he declared that life was full of, of unhappiness, dissatisfaction, suffering, and, uh, but there's a cure for that. It, the cause is attachment and desire, and the cure for that is the Eightfold Path. Okay, so suffering, it can be brought to an end. Uh, there, and there is a way to do it, and then the way is the Eightfold Path. And the Eightfold Path is an interesting collection of ideas. First of all, it's, it's not linear. And, and Susan went home? Probably. Yeah. So we got a room full of guys. So you're all linear. Everything's in a straight line. First I do this, then I do this, then I do this, then I do this. Well, the Eightfold Path is not linear. It starts with, in the Buddhist time, and I read them to you, isn't that fun? That you have right view, right resolve, right speech, right conduct, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right, right concentration. But it doesn't have to start with right view. It can start anywhere along that line. They can be all mixed up. And one of the interesting things about this is the Buddha was talking to a monks. And I think people forget this at times. They forget that the Buddha was talking to monks. Uh, I had another interesting visitor here a few weeks ago who said some of the most outrageous things that I think I've heard in decades. And uh, he just, not only was he pushing <coughs> buttons, but the, the mountains were avalanching on top of me because I'm trying to figure out where in the world is this guy coming up with this stuff? And one of the things he said was that uh, the rules don't matter. The rules within Buddhism really don't matter because Buddhism changes every time it goes into another country. Now, this guy was a college professor. He had a degree in English, concentrating on uh, old literature, the Greek and Roman literature. And uh, he was on the board for a small Zen center in New Mexico. And he informed me that the rules really didn't matter. And I thought that was interesting because it took me back to the 60s and 70s. Do you remember the hippies? Do you remember if it feels good, it's all right? That the rules really don't matter? Whatever I want to do is okay because I want to do it? Doesn't, and, and ultimately by extension, it really doesn't matter if it hurts anybody else because as long as it feels good to me, it's all right. That's the way I take it. And we're still, the repercussions of that, that generation are still hitting our society. And so when he said that, I thought, I said, of course the rules matter. And uh, he was, had a couple teachers, they're probably very good teachers, but they don't follow the rules. Uh, first of all, they're within the Japanese school, 
So the Japanese have just a few rules. Compared to us, we got a ton of rules. In other words, everybody but the Japanese had a lot of rules, and the Japanese just have a few. You know, these monks over here are supposed to follow 250 rules. That's just the, that's just the tip of the iceberg sticking up out of the ground or the ocean. And there's there's other rules you're supposed to follow. But of course, Zen, when it comes to another country, well, we just do whatever we feel like. The rules really don't matter because they change. And I think he's a very confused young man. And But the, the Eightfold Path was specifically written for monks. It was specifically written for ascetics. Let's put it into context. The Buddha has wandered around the forest as a, an ascetic for seven years. Studied with some teachers in the caves and the Himalayas. Uh, the Buddha was lived in Nepal, which we say it's northern India, but that's the place where it was. And he studied with these teachers. They were great gurus. Mastered their teaching. They taught him about uh, shunyata or emptiness. That was another thing this young man said. <laughs> he said that, you know, that was an, a later invention of the Mahayana was the notion of emptiness. I think that's astounding because the Buddha talked about studying with his first two teachers and one teacher taught him how to meditate and another teacher taught him about emptiness. So I don't know what this guy has been reading, but he read, needs to read just a little bit more than he's been reading. And so, if we put this in context, the Buddha has been wandering around the forest. For most of that seven years, he was covered with poop. He had cow dung all over himself. He had ashes. If you want to know what he looked like, just look at any documentary on India today. And if you see the ascetics, you know, the holy men, they'll be covered with cow poop and ash and all this and they would be very skinny, and they eat very little food. That was the way the Buddha was. And he did all these extreme behaviors in an attempt to conquer the self. Because the religious notion in India of practice is to conquer the self. We have nothing else to worry about. I don't need to conquer you. Okay, you may be a total illusion, depending on what school in India you belong to. You may be just a fabrication of my mind, but I have to conquer the self. The Buddha realized the nature of existence. He was worried about people being so unhappy, he discovered why they were unhappy. Because they wanted things that they couldn't have, and they wanted things to stay the way they are. I'm good looking, physically strong, successful person. I want that to continue to the end of my existence. I don't want to get old. I don't want to keep forgetting everything like I do. Okay? I keep saying I need a young monk to follow around with me and remind me why I'm going where I'm going. Then everything would be fine. So when he comes out and he talks about the problems, he had already encountered the middle way. He realized that, and the yogis have known this for three, four thousand years, easy. They've known that if your body is sick, your mind is sick. If your mind is sick, your body is sick. They've always recognized this relationship between body and mind, that they're, they're not separate. So when he realized, uh, well, first of all, he cleaned himself up. He started eating something, got healthy again. He was basically dying, and uh, which with a, a Indian ascetic is no big deal. You just sit under a tree and die, okay? Because you don't, you're no longer interested in food because you, you eat so little you don't care about it. Certainly not interested in sex. No woman in their right mind would have sex with some guy covered with cow poop, okay? You're not interested in visual or tactile sensation because you're just basically numb. And so upon realizing that he was dying and he had not achieved what he wanted, which was to understand 
why life seemed to be filled with unhappiness. He went to the river. He, was, he actually was sitting under a tree not far from the river. He went to the river and he washed, and from then on, every day, he washed. He ate a meal brought by a little girl by the name of Sujata. She brought him some rice pudding in the beginning, and he got stronger, and he got healthy. And seven weeks after entering the middle way, which was not a product of enlightenment, it was a product of realizing everything he had tried didn't work. Therefore, asceticism is not part of Buddhism. Now, I realize those of you watching have been exposed to an enormous amount of stuff. Mr. Anderson came this morning. He talked about getting on the internet and looking up Buddhism and coming up with all kinds of ideas of what Buddhism was, right? Yes. It's just almost endless. A lot of that stuff is just somebody's personal opinion. Well, I read a book, and this is what it is. Or my friend told me. Or this is just simply what I think it should be. Therefore, this is what it is. I lived through that in the 70s when people talked about getting back to primitive Buddhism. Like they knew what that was. Okay? That's like, let's get back to primitive Christianity. Let's go live in the Egyptian desert in a cave. Right? Is that what you want to do? Because that was primitive Christianity. And primitive Buddhism was sleeping outside all the time, being cold, being hungry, being wet. Okay? Um, so maybe they, they really don't want primitive Buddhism. So if we realize that the, the Eightfold Path was originally declared for, for ascetics, think monk. Here's the Buddha who immediately says to his followers, because early on he had, he had a lot. He said you need to stay clean, you need to stay neat, you need to have you, you're not going to overindulge in food, so you're going to have one meal a day, but it was big. But you're also not going to do any physical labor because the proper way to, to occupy your time is to study the Dharma, to study the truth in the world. And so you're going to pra try to practice the things I've taught. So you don't need a lot of food. Their one physical activity was walking from town to town. And the towns in India were never more than 10 miles apart. They were, that was done on purpose, because these people said, I think we'll go over there and see if there's good farmland over there. They'd walk for a day and said, here we are. Let's check it out. And so the towns in those days were basically one afternoon's walk, 10 miles, afternoon's walk. How far? Four hours. How fast do we walk? Two and a half miles an hour, right? Four hours? I had lunch, it's time to move, I walk to the next town, there I am, sleep under a tree, everybody comes out and says, please teach us what your teacher says. So the Buddha said you have to have right view. I researched this this morning, because of all the, eight, the Eightfold Path, right view has always eluded me. I would never really felt that I had an intuitive understanding of what right view was. And that's because it's not intuitive. Right view traditionally is looked at accepting that the world is full of consequences and that if you do something bad, something bad happens. And that's just the way it is. And no matter how much you wish it wouldn't happen, it's going to happen. This monk right here, that one, he works at the federal prison. The federal prison is full of people who believe that they can do something and not have to suffer the consequences. And he will tell you if you ask him that most of those people go out and do the same stuff over again thinking that they won't get caught and they won't have to suffer the consequences, right? Correct. Yeah, it is, it is the, the uh, like it's a thief's mentality. Okay, now I know how to do this so that I won't get caught and they go, and they go out and they do it a few times, they get caught, 
They go back to prison. They say to everybody, oh, I, I was out of here for a while. What did I do wrong? And everybody goes, oh, let me tell you. Because they're all authorities on how not to go to prison. They're all in prison. So now he goes out and maybe he gets away with it for a year. And then the police stop him. In the newspaper I read, they stop this guy because the tail light's out. He's got five pistols, 12 shotguns, 15 pounds of heroin, $1,200 in his trunk. They start to get suspicious because he's acting suspicious. But he got away with it for a year. And he's on probation. And he got away for a year, so he's back in the jail again. Life is full of consequences. But you're a monk, so you're not doing bad stuff like that. But this is where the notion, the acceptance of karma comes from. Because karma is about consequences. If, you, if you've done bad things, at some point, something's going to happen in your life. And, and now, this is, these are primitive people. This was 2,500 years ago. I mean, one of the questions human beings always ask is, why me? I'm such a good person. Steve's a good person. How come I'm just driving down the road and this guy pulls out in front of me and stops? And there's this big accident. Why me? And the Christians, they look up there. They go, why me? Okay. Well, the, the Buddhists, the early Buddhists, they, they had to have, you know, there, there had to be a cause other than themselves, right? <clears throat> they go, why me? Everybody went, why me? Well, the Indians were just developing the idea of maybe in a previous life, because they believed in previous birth lives, you did something bad. And so this thing happened to you to teach you a lesson. I love the Tibetans. Most of the stuff with Tibetan Buddhism I'm not real real fond of. But I love their idea that life is, is school. And that we come here and when bad things happen we learn. Okay? And what do we learn? We learn not to be unhappy. See Zen, what do I get out of Zen? Zen teaches me how not to be unhappy because bad things happen. I don't have to accept the fact that I lived a previous life. I'm not being punished because there's nobody to punish me. It's just this weird Indian idea that for every cause and effect, there's back and forth, you know, kind of a plane with physics. So Zen teaches me it doesn't matter what the happens. That's just what is. I've been in two really pretty profound car accidents both of which I was a passenger. And both times the cars were completely destroyed. Why me? Why not me? Somebody had to be sitting in the passenger seat in that car when we got T-boned. Both times T-boned. First time the lady had a, had a fifth of whiskey between her knees. It spilled when she got in the accident. So, the right view is there are consequences in life. 
which implies karma. That the things you do have consequences. Now, I want to take it one further because we practice the Mahayana. If I do something terrible to somebody else, the consequence is that they suffer. Why do I care? Because I would like to stop suffering in the world. And the only way I can stop my suffering is to not cause other people to suffer. That's the big idea. Right resolve. These first two, I never was sure about them. I pretended I knew what they meant. I really did. I just pretended because they don't talk about meditation, so I can skip over those and we can get to meditation, right? Now I can talk about meditation, right? Resolve. Well, the early understanding of right resolve was you become a monk. Now, this is the path towards happiness. It has been interpreted as a path towards enlightenment, assuming that one, they are both one and the same. So I will ask, and I'll ask about hi. Do you think you can be happy and not enlightened? No. Really? I'm happy and I'm not enlightened. I suppose that's the definition of enlightenment, correct? Could be. I don't know. I haven't got time to think about it. Because the minute I start thinking about this elusive enlightenment stuff, then I'm probably going to go, oh, geez. I still got a distance to go. <clears throat> so. But the resolve is, and why? Because monks lead a life that's not full of, of, of all kinds of distractions. Okay, now remember, he's, a, he's in the beginning, he's an Indian. We would call him a Hindu. Okay? He followed the Vedas. Now, he set them aside. One of the things the Buddha did in his time was he set the Vedas aside. And his students said, well, okay, they're wrong, right? And the Buddha said, no, they're not wrong, right? It's just, you have to test them. There's probably a lot of really good stuff. There's probably a lot of wisdom in the, in the, the Vedas. But don't just accept them blindly. When he died on his deathbed, he told his disciples, right? Don't, don't believe anything that I said. Test everything that I've taught you. This is not about changing rules because it goes to another country. This is about test what I taught you. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. So Zen, you have to test Zen. Now let me tell you something. You do Zen for a week and it doesn't work and you quit, that's not testing it. That's just like going and saying, I didn't build any big muscles in a week, so I'm going to stop going to the gym. No, no, you, have to, you actually have to jump in the water and get wet. And then if it doesn't work for you, that's fine. Go out and do TM. Do something else. Listen to ocean sounds, waves breaking on the, on the shore. You get all nice and peaceful, and maybe you won't suffer so much from anxiety. But the Buddha repeatedly told his disciples the way towards happiness and ultimately enlightenment is the life of a monk. Because monks are not supposed to overeat, and traditionally, they don't involve themselves in sexual activity. And they don't become attached to things. They don't own anything that they don't really need. OK, don't tell me I own more than one guitar, because I'll just <laughs> tell you to be quiet. OK? But the life, the life has gotten so simple. And we talk about attachment. I can, and yes, you can have things as long as you're not attached. But don't kid yourself and say, oh, I'm not attached to that. I walked into a house that pro a monk had that was probably worth three or four million dollars. And I went, oh. <laughs> I was just, I couldn't speak. <gasps> and he says, oh, it's just stuff. No, you don't live in a four million dollar house and it's just stuff. Okay, you're just kidding yourself that you have all of this stuff. The others, which are uh, speech and action and livelihood, those are where we get our five precepts because after a while, people came to the Buddha and they said, you know, you're really good. We like what you have to say. 
We follow your teachings and they, they help us be happier in our life. But, you know, I like my wife. I like living with my kids. I like my husband. I like my farm. I like our little uh, apothecary shop. Uh, I, I like our little restaurant that we run. Uh, I like going out on Friday night and watching movies. No movies back then, but they had puppet shows. I like all of these things. But I also like you. And we come, every time you come near our village, we come and we listen to your teaching. And we find that we become happier and happy, happier as we follow your teachings. You know, and, and uh, the Buddha might have said to them, well, so how did that work? And they said, well, you know, you talked about we need to stop thinking about ourselves all the time. So now we have the practice. We go and, and when we see people who are hungry, we feed them. And when we see people who are sad, we comfort them. And we try, we try to take care of other people than ourselves. And the Buddha said, that's good. And so he gave the five precepts. They said, well, give us some rules for us to follow. And this guy said, remember the guy? Oh, the rules change as you go to country to country. No, they don't. The five rules only changed in Japan. And they almost have them. They came up with 10 and 13 and 14, and they almost have them. Don't take life. Every Buddhist in the world except the Japanese, well, actually, they follow that one, too. Don't take life. Don't take what doesn't belong to you. Don't say things that will hurt other people. No backbiting, no gossip. Don't indulge in improper sexual conduct. When people become a Buddhist here, we say don't commit adultery. Americans need to work on that one really hard. Learn to be faithful. And then finally, don't become intoxicated. Don't take intoxicants. And those five all have to do with don't cause suffering. They have nothing to do with you being happy directly. They have everything with you to do with you being happy indirectly. Because everything has consequences. If you cause suffering with someone else, that suffering will come back on you. There are always consequences to your actions. So buried in the Eightfold Path are those three. And I've talked for a long time. And I need to stop talking. So next week, am I here next week? I think so. I'll finish talking about this. 